thank you so much, and I think we have some time for a discussion. And anybody who wants books afterwards, I'd be happy to sign them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, are there any lists of drone park manufacturers uh, that, you know, there's some practical people like to spot them in their own districts and uh, <coughs> Buffalo, and we've heard rumors that there is one in Buffalo, but we can't find any information. Well, I mentioned in the book a, a case of a, uh, uh, a guy um, who was curious about this and decided he was in Indiana and wanted to find out what are the connections that Indiana had in the uh, drone industry. And he did a Freedom of Information Act, and he was amazed at all that he discovered, all of the connections in Indiana that included university connections, uh, think tank connections, uh, drone manufacturers, uh, research parks that were doing uh, work with the drones, um, professors that were involved in the drone industry. Uh, and um, he said, Indiana's nothing special. There's no reason why there should be all of this connection to drones just here. And he says, I bet if anybody did that in any state, they would find an enormous number of connections to the drone industry. Mm -hmm. You have to do your own Freedom of Information Act request. And I can put you in touch with him because he said it was quite easy and, and is anxious to get other people to do it. But I think this is what we have to do. This is the only way that the Electronic Frontier Foundation got the list that they got. And they are supposed to be getting more lists. You can go on their website and look for the list there um, that does mention quite a number of them, but it's only a very, very small number. I mean, my sense is there are thousands and thousands uh, of, of companies and research centers involved in this. And of course, it's done on purpose because they want to be all over the country, and this becomes, like other weapons, a question of jobs. Just that. In, in terms of the operators of the drone, so maybe they you know, have a better ergonomic chair, something like that. But Peter Singer's research showed that actually the rates of conversation are higher for the drone operators than they are for soldiers on the ground because they don't have that camaraderie and they know they're killing people, they see the bug, like you said, the, what they see, what happens. And then they go home and play with their kids, and they know, even though it feels like it seems to be a video game, and they know that it's not. So I just wonder if you have more information on that, because of course it's a lose lose. That's what we know. Yeah, I have a chapter in the book on the those who are piloting the drones, and it's very interesting. I mean, of course, these things, just like being in the battlefield itself, affect individuals in different ways. But there is a tremendous disconnect for people who are killers by day and try to be lovers by night. Um, they go home and they want a romantic evening with their wife or their girlfriend, or they want to uh, coach the kids' soccer team, or they go to the church on Sunday, and um, they try not to tell their family what they are doing, what they have done, uh, and that's very hard to car car compartmentalize your, your life like that. Um, they also talk in a strange way about how sometimes they come to know their victims in a way that uh, other soldiers on the battle don't know, and uh, bomber pilots could never know, because they often are hovering over the homes of these people for days at a time. And they're watching the activities. They watch the women and the family going to wash the clothes, and they see the children going out, and uh, they kind of get to know the family, and then they're told, okay, now press the button. So, um, yes, it's a, it's a very hard thing for many of them to understand. Uh, to, 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 to live with. On the other hand, um, there are other pilots who say they sit in front of this console for hours and hours and hours and hours and it's very boring and they want a little action. And you know, that's what some of the soldiers in the field to often tell you, they want a little action. And so they're looking for a bad guy. And uh, there was one, uh, there's a section in the book where I, I quote a, a, um, one of these pilots who talks about how he is watching a group of Iraqis, a group of men sitting in a park. And he says, ah, a group of men sitting in a park looks suspicious. I think I'll just keep this uh, drone right over them and watch what they do. And he said, I got a lesson in their culture because I see they're holding hands and they're mm -hmm. dancing with each other. And 
he still was very suspicious. Uh, and he said, oh, one of them went out and he figured, okay, he's going to come back now with the weapons. You know, now that the dancing is done, we'll bring out the weapons. And he said, they came back in, but he didn't bring any weapons. And he says, um, gosh, I guess, you know, they're just sitting around and shooting the bull and having a good time. And I couldn't press the button and I was so disappointed because I really wanted some oh. action tonight. Oh. And so um, I think uh, we're putting our soldiers, whether it's the pilots or, of course, whether it's the soldiers on the ground, in very difficult situations. Did your book have the story of the two U.S. soldiers who were on the ground? Yeah, yeah, it does. I mean, I, I was wondering. Um, these drones are, are very uh, racist weapons in the way they're used because they're used to kill people who are non-white people. Um, but uh, sometimes they make mistakes and they killed uh, a couple of Americans, not the Americans I talked about in Yemen, who uh, the U.S. government doesn't admit it killed. Um, but yes, um, a mistake, mistook these two Americans and at first uh, didn't tell the families the truth. Uh, so yes, there are now examples of these drones being used to kill our own soldiers by mistake. Are there more than two weeks? No. That we know of. Yeah. yeah. In the sense of, you might say, of theology, but the, I read that, I don't know if it was Christopher Hedges, I'm not, this isn't my thought necessarily, I'm kind of repeating, but the idea that leaders uh, ultimately in nations have the quality of killing as a sign of their ultimate uh, leadership and in that sense take over the role of God, you might say. Although I'm not sure that God kills that anymore, he allows death, but not uh, kill, it's not supposed to allow killing in, in a social uh, belief structure. Well, I think it's an important comment, and I am trying to get help from people around this country about how do we bring this issue into the spiritual, the religious community, and have it be at least a discussion that people are having in their places of worship. Uh, I, I have a chapter that's on the morality of this issue, and uh, let me tell you, it's hard to find leaders in the religious movement who are speaking out against drones. And I was kind of amazed by it. Um, I remember, and some of you were uh, similarly uh, of age to remember during the, uh, the, the wars in Central America, how many religious leaders were part of our movement and what a spiritual movement that was. And I looked to some of those religious leaders and couldn't find them speaking out on this issue. So uh, I'd love to talk to any of you who are interested about how do we push those people to take a position on this. Uh, let's say we want to get 100 religious leaders to come out with a statement uh, about the immorality of using uh, lethal drones to, um, to kill people. And uh, I think that would be a, a, an important way to force them to take a position and to start providing some leadership on this. I think it would be useful to use uh, rather horrendous pictorial, uh, you know, pictures of the victims uh, at the top of the page, to say an eight and a half by 11 that might be handed out in Chicago or in Washington next week. At the top, it's got the drones. At the bottom, it's got kids in hospital beds bleeding and da da da. You know, it's kind of abrasive and aggravates some people. But on the other hand, uh, Amy Klein's, I think, book Shock Doctrine had to the, you know, the Bush people. They thought, well, we'll bomb the daylight out of them and get away with it. Yeah. Away with that would be advantageous. Yeah. Well, I saw you had some materials that had some of the photos there and. Um, I think it's important to show that these are real people who are being killed. Um, the photographer, there's one photographer in Pakistan who has been risking his life to get photos of drone victims. And um, risking his life because nobody on any of the sides wants the pictures taken. In fact, they do say that when the U.S. Uh, hits people who are uh, working with the Taliban, the Taliban people come in immediately and try to clear all the evidence because they don't want to show that their own people were killed. And um, 
So this guy really does risk his life, and I want to just read a little passage from him saying, there are just pieces of flesh lying around after a strike. You can't find bodies. So the locals pick up the flesh and curse America. And they say America is killing us inside our own country, inside our own homes, and only because we are Muslims. Um, he does have some pictures of dead bodies, but most of the times the bodies are just gone. Uh, and the other thing that I found very interesting, because it's a very um, traditional, conservative society, they don't let him take any pictures of the female victims. So the only victims you see are children and men. Um, but we just pushed to get a whole set of his photographs. And um, we're going to have them available at the Drone Summit this weekend. And I agree with you. I think showing real um, human beings is a way to make this much more uh, real for people. Uh, you said that uh, Pakistan, we have uh, permission to use these, strike, these uh, drones in Pakistan, but not Yemen. Who gives permission? I just, <laughs> I yeah. mean, it might be obvious thing, but I just wanted to spell it out. Well, it's not very obvious. It's actually quite complicated. Okay. And um, the National Security Ag Agency works with the president. Okay. And it's the president that ultimately gives this uh, permission. Yes. Um, it certainly, as I said, was not the Pakistani government that gave permission. Um, it is permission from the highest levels of our government that gives that uh, to the CIA. And uh, one issue I didn't bring up is the problem of lack of congressional oversight. And that this has become a way of transferring amazing amounts of power into the hands of the executives. So on the one hand, you have an agency, the CIA, that reports to the intelligence committees in Congress. And you have uh, the military, the Joint Special Operations Command, that has its own secret drone program that reports to the armed services. And that is purposely done so that nobody gets uh, a full picture of what's happening. And um, one of the uh, responses to the Washington Post article on Tuesday about the request to expand uh, the, the, the strikes in Yemen came out in an op-ed today by a law professor from Yale. And I thought it was so interesting, I, I, I think you, you would all find the argument interesting, because he says, um, he's, his argument is that after 9-11, uh, the Congress passed this authorization for the use of force, you know, that, that Barbara Lee was the only one that voted against. But it was not a, uh, it had a caveat, and that caveat was, the use of force against groups and countries that were involved in the terrorist attacks on September 9-11. And then he goes on to say, but now Petraeus, uh, General Petraeus, is seeking permission to expand bombing raids whenever there is a suspicious behavior at sites known to be controlled by a terrorist group called Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. That's the name of the group, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. But that group did not even exist on September 11th. So this law professor is saying, um, you have to go to Congress. Now that's, you know, interesting. <laughs> But raise your hand if you think Congress is going to say, no, we are not going to give you that permission to expand your own strikes in Yemen. No, they're going to say it's up to the president. They're, they're going to say it's up to the president, or they're going to say whatever you think is important, those who feel, you know, that our Congress is just so horrible on these issues. It's not very consoling to me that uh, the, the Yale law professor thinks that the way to deal with this is to go to Congress. Do you know if there are drones in Colombia? Uh, I don't know if there are drones in Colombia. Does anybody else? Colombia. Yes, there are certain uh, like uh, there are certain uh, derivatives of drones that are being used in Colombia. You know, to combat the drug uh, trade. <laughs> Yes, Mexico certainly has drones and is using drones, and the U.S. is using drones that go into the Mexican, uh, violate Mexican sovereignty. Did you have a question? 
You know, the, I think everybody may have seen the video of the helicopter in Iraq that went viral. It's got millions of hits now and everything else. But the thing, I may be a little jaded about this, but those aren't heroes flying those drums and those helicopters. Though you watch that, and you can see, you can listen to the pilots talking, lying about the people on the ground saying, he got a gun, boom, boom, boom. He's got a gun, there's no gun. There's nobody with guns. There's one, two or three guys in the back, way over with guns. There's kids in the van. There's people laying on the ground that they've already killed. And they're, doing, and they're talking to each other like, hey, this is, this is, let's do more. Those people, are, the mercenaries that are more and more and more going in, they're being bribed to go and take all this training. They're not heroes. They've got to be confronted at some level. And if it's not us, I don't know who should be doing it. But the truth of the matter, like Obama the other day, one of the best ones I ever heard, get rid of some sergeant, an Iraq veteran, for calling him a coward in print. And he actually had him drummed out of the military on the basis of him calling him a coward. These are the kind of people that are taking over the military. You've got these SEAL teams. I know a couple of them from the city that I come from. They're killers. They're rotten sons of bitches. They belong in prison or kill themselves. It's terrible the way these people are. But well, well, maybe you're jaded, but you know, the military is uh, trains people to be killers. Right. You know, that's what they go into the military, and that's the training they get, and they're told to think of these people as ragheads and as uh, uh, butt splat and squirt squirters, and, and yeah. Um, and of course, they go and they do their job, and sometimes they uh, go overboard. Um, but yeah, we've got, to, we've got to stop the killing, and I think that's what we all agree to here. So, yes. Um, this is more of a question of tactics. We frequently locally have the, have the, the, the unresolved conversation about, is it okay to bring our message to a festival, to a ball game, to a parade? The idea being people's heads are not open, they're not receptive, they're not interested, and well, are we not just alienating people? Um, I feel like we have a paucity of creativity. You know, how do we how do we deal with that? I think we have to go everywhere. Uh, I think we have to go to festivals, we have to go to parades, let these children see these killing machines. Uh, I think we also have to go to people's houses and to their places of worship. Really important to go directly. Um, because um, they're real people, they're involved in immoral acts, and um, we have to be creative <coughs> about how we do that. Um, I like going to people's homes. You know, I, I went to the home of uh, Eric Prince from Blackwater, mm. and, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a very funny experience, though, because. Um, I knocked on the door and his, and his wife was there and she said, come on in. <laughs> <laughs> and so I found myself in the home of Eric Prince and I started asking her about uh, Eric Prince's activities and how did it feel to be making all this money and living in this wonderful home from uh, killing people. And uh, suddenly she realized it wasn't a friendly person trying from the PTA or something. Uh, and so she called the police and had me arrested for trespassing. After she um, we went to trial and she had to come to testify against me. But the very funniest thing is that my partner who was there with me had on tape her saying, come on in. <laughs> that to the judge, he looked at her and he said, lady, he invited her into the house. <laughs> I, I don't know if this is just an observation or potential for coalition building, but I, I kept flashing on stand your ground as you were describing, you know, how much racial profiling and all of that. I just wonder, you know, what kind of creativity that might suggest. That Do you want to explain that a little more? 
Well, the, the law in Florida that says that people have a right to defend themselves against suspected, um, you know, uh, attackers when obviously, at least in the case that has become so famous, uh, there's very little likelihood that there was an attack about that. Which, parenthetically, I just want to say, they're trying to pass that in New York State. People I just saw that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so far, to your uh, state records are yeah, I think now that the, there's so many people that have woken up into, in the United States about these standard ground laws and are getting incensed about it and trying to stop them from being passed in their state and roll them back in the states that already have them, this is a tremendous community for us to work with and to be part of uh, stopping them and rolling them back, to be standing with, those, with the, the people in the community who are most affected by these laws. Uh, and to make these such intimate connections between violence at home and, and violence overseas. I was just going to remind people that Hillary Clinton is coming to the Maxwell School on Monday. And I don't know if there's going to be anybody who's able to, to be there and ask the right question. At Syracuse University, noon on Monday. Who will be there? Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton. I'm just going to put it out there because I've already got several good questions that somebody could ask her Sarah, like about the Iran sanctions and about the so Trump. That we could all hear it. I'm sorry. That's right. You've heard us say Usually, usually I talk pretty loud. Mm -hmm. You want me to try again? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hillary Clinton is coming to the Maxwell School Monday at noon, and it may take a while waiting, you know, getting in line or whatever to get to see her. But I think it would be very, very helpful if one or two people could ask some of the questions that Nadia has already raised and get some answers and put her on the spot. And it's open to the public. It's open to the public. It's first come, first served, and the doors open at 9:30. She's probably not speaking till about noon. That's Diane. Somebody said it's at. Oh, right, right, right. It's at Henry's Chapel. Everybody hear that? It's at Henry's Chapel, not at Maxwell School. Well, I think that's a wonderful idea. Yes, ask her about the crippling sanctions and ask her how she feels about the drones and should the CIA be in the business of, of killing people with drones? Yes. Uh, I don't think that I can come, uh, and it pains me. But I would hope that someone would ask this question of that woman in the State Department. When you hear her on TV or radio now, she said, Oh, the people in Syria, they must get their freedom and all that. And it's terrible that even one person dies in Syria. But our country, had, why haven't we uh, uh, apologized to the Canadian young engineer who we sent over on those uh, to be tortured in Syria for a year? He came back to Canada, they found him innocent. Our country has not apologized, mm -hmm. and uh, the question is, why not? And uh, it's, a it's a terror, it just makes me, this country is so rotten, I can't stand it. Well, let me add another um, example to, uh, to ask her about, which is about Bahrain. And, you know, as we are speaking now, there is a wonderful man dedicated his life to nonviolent activity who is about to die. I mean, he's been on a hunger strike, and this is about the 75th day. And he might be dead just tomorrow or the next day. We've heard that he stopped drinking water. Uh, and meanwhile, there is a international car races, the, the Formula One that's starting this weekend in Bahrain, disgusting. And it's a government, an old-fashioned monarchy that thinks a king ought to be in control and use the Saudis to come in and, and uh, crush an, an uprising there. And the U.S. barely says a word about Bahrain because we have, the Navy has its fifth fleet base there. And so, yes, if I were to talk to Hillary Clinton, I would certainly ask her why the U.S. is in cutting off its relations with the Bahraini government, pulling out the fifth fleet from there, and stop giving uh, weapons to the killers in, the, 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 of, in Bahrain. So maybe we could take one, one more. Could you uh, just talk a little bit about the upcoming summit that you mentioned? And, and if, if possible, um, when I think of Code Pink, I think of left of the left. 
And, and then I could go. Did you say left and left? Left of the left. Left and left. And, and then, then there's the rest of us. And, and, and I'm just trying to get a sense of how you see tactical and strategic organizing that can take place down the road that integrates some of the, I will say, vanguard efforts that are going on and some of the other organizing efforts that are going on. And maybe you can just speak to that a little bit in terms of what, what you see coming down the road in terms of national and regional organizing around the drone. Well, first let me say, I don't know, you know, left, 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 and left, and left, but there are people in this room who have been to jail for six months for uh, crossing the line at School of the Americas. Who's here? Raise your hand. room that have taught many of us in Code Pink what it means to really um, live the life of uh, dedication to, uh, to peace. And I have tremendous um, inspiration from people in this room. And I was here at the, the, uh, the trials of some of you and, and um, it stays with me. And I, I, I think that um, people like you here uh, are the spiritual core, the best values that our country represents. And um, it's really making those va values that are latent within so many other members of our community um, more open and giving them a chance to express those values. I think when it comes to drones, um, that's why I do feel that as a non-practicing Jew, uh, I am very determined to work in the religious community about this drone issue because I think it's a deeply religious, spiritual issue. Mm -hmm. And um, I think if we could get uh, the church-going community, the temple-going community, the mosques to be having interfaith dialogues about this, um, if we could bring it up to the highest levels of some of these um, church groups, um, if we could have it discussed by bishops, by rabbis, by imams, uh, I think we could get a pretty amazing discussion going. On the other hand, and this brings me to the summit, you know, we wanted to get people from the uh, international uh, law community and the students who are studying law. If their professors won't come out and speak out against this, at least the students should be coming out and speaking out. And so the drone summit that's happening next weekend, and I really encourage any of you who can go to please come and join us because it's gonna be the first of its kind. And let me be honest about it, um, it has been hard to get people to register. We've made it very affordable, $20 and up sliding scale and said anybody who can't afford the $20 just come. And it's like pulling teeth to get people to come because people are still not even aware of this issue. I mean, recognize that you, know, you are in the vanguard here and most people really don't even know that we're using what, what drones are all about. Um, so we're bringing together an amazing array of people. Uh, the fact that we have a member of parliament coming from Pakistan, hopefully we have this lawyer. We have Jeremy Scavel who's just spent time in Yemen and Somalia with really incredible first-hand information about what the drone strikes are doing there. We have uh, people from the board of Amnesty International. We have members from the uh, ACLU who have done this great legal work about thrones at home. We have uh, activists from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, we have the expert in the use of uh, drones along the border uh, of Mexico who is coming. And um, so I think it's going to be a time where we really try to recognize that it's not apples and oranges. It's not, okay, here's the people who are working around domestic privacy issues, and here's the people working around the killer drones, and you know, that we're really part, we're really together in this. And that the drone is a piece of technology that brings us together. And that technology, you know, something we haven't talked about, but I think should recognize that it could be used for good. 
It's not that this piece of technology is somehow automatically a terrible, evil thing. It's how it's used. And uh, I, I, um, I think that the discussion we're going to have this weekend, one is going to, information is going to be tremendous for people. And if you can't come, we are going to live stream it. And we also are going to have people videoing it. We're going to make short videos and longer videos out of it. And we're going to have the Pacifica um, radio stations are going to broadcast the whole thing and then be playing pieces of it. So it's really going to help spread the word a lot, educate people a lot. Um, but the second day is going to be a strategy session. And we're really going to sit down and try to hammer out, OK, you know, where do we go from here? What do we build? How do we support the campaigns that are already happening? How do we make more happen? How do we get students involved? How do we get the religious community? How do we get, you know, a hundred law professors to sign up to something? So I'm very excited that this will uh, strengthen our movements. And I think the timing is great. The fact that you're doing this tomorrow, that this is going to really inspire people for the weekend. Uh, and I guess um, to end uh, on this note that, um, the, the, the drones are uh, a piece of technology that we are using to shine a light on the undemocratic nature of our society. And that um, we use the drone 